So we call this treating sudden cardiac death and we'll focus on the subcutaneous ICD and the particular role that that plays and you know, what role that plays in our armamentarium of tools that we use um, to protect our patients. So a few of my disclosures, this is a broad informational topic, how it shapes your clinical practice is your responsibility. I think we all know that, but um, you'll find it very interesting anyway, I hope. So let's start with some basic definitions. What is sudden cardiac death? Sudden cardiac death is something that occurs unexpectedly. It's sudden without warning. Death occurs within minutes of the onset of this thing. And it's cardiac in nature, pump failure of some sort in nature. This is sudden cardiac death. Um, so then you ask, well, is sudden cardiac death an important problem? It is an important problem. About 350,000 cases per year in the United States. That's about 43 victims per hour. So you can think statistically in the hour that we spend here tonight, about 40 patients in the United States are going to um, succumb to sudden cardiac death and 20% survival. Well, you can say, well, if it's death, how does it survive? And there's a, there's a time when you can intervene and then it's not death, you know, you survive the event. But, uh, so 20% survival, high mortality rate, and um, a significant problem in the United States. And then it's a leading cause of death in the United States. So if you compare this to HIV, AIDS, breast cancer, lung cancer, stroke, you know, sudden cardiac death amounts to the same burden that all of those disease processes combined will, um, will cause in terms of mortality. So then we ask, seems cardiac in nature, but how, in point of fact, does sudden cardiac death kill someone? 80 to 90% of sudden cardiac death events are due to ventricular tachyarrhythmias, either ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, where your heart is just beating too fast and it's too <coughs> asynchronous for effective cardiac output. You just have no blood flow. And so eventually, you know, that will kill you. Also, acute myocardial infarction or bradycardia where your heart's going too slow. So if someone has a massive heart attack such that they don't have any muscle alive for the heart to beat, you know, that sudden cardiac death as well without the arrhythmia, the pump just fails. And um, also bradycardia for people who suddenly are just going way too slow. It's the same as going way too fast. We just don't have adequate cardiac output to support life and unless we intervene with CPR, um, those patients too will not survive their sudden cardiac um, death event. But the vast majority, let's recognize, are the rhythms that go too fast, um, ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. And that's a breakdown of the ventricular arrhythmias that can, that, that can be causative for sudden cardiac death. Just good old VT, 62%, um, ventricular fibrillation, about 10%. Torsades, which is a special form of VT, you know, where the ECG has some um, very interesting patterns, accounting for 13%. So you say, why do patients have ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation? Good question. And we know the cause of that. Really, it's coronary artery disease, good old fashioned blocked arteries in your heart, causing over 80% of sudden cardiac death episodes in Western countries. And sudden cardiac death, you dying or suddenly collapsing and otherwise dying, is the first evidence of coronary disease in 63% of women and half of men. So you didn't know you had anything wrong with your heart, and the next thing you know, you know you've had this event, a sudden cardiac death event, unless someone's there to resuscitate you, um, it's fatal. So that's concerning, very concerning, because none of us, most of us don't know the status of our coronary arteries, and we could be in any stage of coronary disease without knowing it, without having had any symptoms related to our blocked arteries, and that's the herald event. Um, concerning. So what is the progression? Um, due to coronary disease, we have ischemia, so areas of the heart that are hungry for oxygen, that makes them electrically unstable, or true blockages, which have resulted in small heart attacks or infarcts, where the heart muscle is replaced with scar. Presence of scar in heart muscle is also electrically destabilizing, and it will predispose you to ventricular arrhythmias. So we can have, on the left, a stable plaque in your heart, which ruptures due to stress, 
and then suddenly a blood clot forms on that ruptured plaque, and you had a non-obstructive atherosclerotic lesion, which is all of a sudden 100% occluded, and the heart all of a sudden has no blood supply. The heart is infarcting, it's hungry for oxygen, there is acidosis, and the ventricular arrhythmias begin. That block, on the other hand, could slowly progress to the time where it results in a total blockage. And then with that slow progression, you can have the same effect. The heart is suddenly missing its blood flow, and that leads to ischemia, probably an infarct, electrically destabilizing. And for people who have survived those events, maybe not even known that they had them, we think of those as silent ischemias or old MIs that were not clinically recognized, um, they're, left with, they're left with scar. So some of the muscle has died. Um, the body clears away all that necrotic debris, if you like, and replaces it with collagen, scar tissue, which is electrically destabilizing and really facilitates these very dangerous heart rhythms that we see below. The person's in normal rhythm, suddenly they're in this very fast rhythm, it starts instantaneously, and as time progresses and as that heart runs out of oxygen and blood supply, we see those electrical signals get smaller and smaller and smaller until you're flatlining. And unless someone does CPR during this time and delivers an appropriate shock to the heart, that person's not gonna survive the event. So then we ask the question, how do we prevent sudden cardiac death? Since we know what it is and we know what causes it, how do we prevent it? So these are all the things that we do in medicine. First of all, for people who have coronary disease and even for those who don't know if they do, which is probably the case for most of us, including myself, we modify risk factors. So you wanna control your blood pressure, control your diabetes, stop smoking, reduce your stress, eat properly, get regular exercise. If you're known to have coronary disease and it's advanced enough, we revascularize, either place stents or send people to bypass surgery, give appropriate medications for cholesterol, aspirin, Plavix, to prevent blood clots from forming on ruptured plaque. That's what the aspirin Plavix does in patients with heart disease. And those things also will promote electrical quiescence. The beta blockers, the antiarrhythmic drugs when they're indicate, we try to calm the heart down from a rhythm point of view. And then we realize after doing all of those things, in some cases, people still aren't adequately protected. And then we think about implantable cardioverter defibrillators or ICDs. And probably all of us know some people who have been implanted with ICDs. Historically, up until very recently, that was always what we call the transvenous ICD, where the lead went through your veins, into your heart, and between the ICD can and that lead that was your defibrillator system, it could shock you out of dangerous rhythms. Very recently, we have the subcutaneous ICD, which is not using your veins, not actually going into your heart, it's outside your rib cage, provides you with all of the protection of a transvenous ICD. And that's a new technology, it's very interesting, and I'll show you how, you got, how we got there and um, the important features of that device. So first of all, who gets a defibrillator? Who qualifies for a defibrillator? And this has been studied in detail. And studied in detail in part because it's so important and also because it's so expensive. So we really wanna make sure we're using this technology appropriately. So the first three studies are in red, are anybody who's had a sudden cardiac death event deserves an ICD. If you have at least one year prognosis, you deserve an implantable defibrillator. So we easily prove that the defibrillators in those patients save lives, because you have a recurrence, that device can shock you or it can pace you, and you survive. If you have not had an arrhythmia or a sudden cardiac death event, but you have enough heart disease, meaning you've had a prior infarction, the pump function of your heart is sufficiently reduced or maybe we've seen some ventricular arrhythmias in that context or you're having heart failure, a number of studies have shown that ICD therapy is life-saving in those contexts. So you are high enough risk that you will go on to have those events such that if you have a defibrillator in place, it's gonna protect you and it's gonna save your life and your survival will be prolonged. So we've proven quite well where we can use these devices, which in a way has been importantly shown to save lives. So that's good. We understand sudden cardiac death. We have defibrillators. 
So now we ask, are we actually protecting those people at risk? This is a very interesting graph. The top figures are the majority of those 300,000 patients, these numbers here, of people who will actually die this year of sudden cardiac death. And it's really the general population. Those who are high risk for coronary disease, they've never had a clinical event. They might have had a coronary event, but we thought it was minor. They don't qualify for ICDs by those studies I showed you. They don't have an ICD because they don't qualify. That's the hundreds of thousands of people are actually gonna die this year from sudden cardiac death. Interesting. The people who we have proven where the ICD is of benefit, those are those with the um, low ejection fraction, they survived a cardiac risk event. Those who qualify for the ICD, indeed those devices will be life-saving, but look, that's only a minority of the individuals who will have sudden cardiac death this year. So we recognize that the vast majority who will have this event are not protected, and when we can truly identify those people who do meet criteria for ICDs, it's really important that they get one because they are at very high risk and we deserve to offer them the protection they deserve. So again, our guidelines for implanting ICDs fail the majority of sudden cardiac death victims because it doesn't include them. And then we have to think too that doctors fail the majority of patients who qualify for ICDs because the majority of people who do meet criteria, even still in today's day and age, aren't offered an ICD and don't receive the implant. So if you think of the whole iceberg being that 350,000 sudden cardiac death victims, everyone below water didn't qualify for an ICD. Everyone above water did qualify for the ICD, but only those on the very tip of that iceberg will actually receive the defibrillator and, and get protection. So as providers, healthcare providers, and that includes all of us, you know, we have an obligation to reduce sudden cardiac death mor mor uh, mortality. And that's by identifying patients at risk, advising those people of their risk, providing appropriate therapy, whether that's medications, opening blocked arteries, or ICD implant, and then really encourage people to have these therapies because their risk is so high. So I hope we're doing that. And that's a picture of my cardio cardiology fellowship group um, in Columbia, New York, when we all started back in 2007. And I'd like to think and hope that all of us in our practices are um, playing our role in addressing sudden cardiac death. From a cost perspective, these devices are expensive. We all know that. Um, in terms of life years saved, the cost is relatively low. So again, who qualifies for an ICD? It's Anyone who's never had an arrhythmia but their pump function is low, whether that's due to blocked arteries or another cause, they qualify for an ICD. Or anyone who has survived a sudden cardiac death event. Their risk is high enough that they'll have another one, they deserve an ICD, regardless of whether their heart is structurally normal or compromised. So we look for those high risk people who have not had an event and then we offer the therapy to anyone who has had an event. And this is kind of the progression from the 1980s where we were sewing pads onto the outside of the patient's heart so that it could shock them appropriately. Maybe thousands of those devices were implanted. You had to have survived two sudden cardiac death events to even qualify. I've met patients with patches sewn to their heart from that era. It's almost surreal. And then, <laughs> Kind of in the 1980s, we started with the transvenous ICDs that I talked about, the ones that go through your veins into your heart, and there are millions of those devices wide um, long term. 2012, we were introduced to the subcutaneous ICD. It's a device that sits under your skin, the lead is under your skin, all of it is outside your rib cage, none of it's touching your heart, none of, none of it is interfering with your vasculature, maybe compromising your vasculature, providing you with all of that ICD protection, very new device, and that's the subcutaneous um, defibrillator, and that's what we'll eventually focus on. So that was FDA approved for the United States September 2012, important date for us. The Europeans, always ahead, had that device since 2009. So um, we're not first, but we have it now, and um, that's important. So again, that's the basic comparison, and this is literally the picture that I show my patients in the clinic when I'm explaining the difference. 
On the left, we have the transvenous ICD. You know, it's the device that sits under your skin over your chest muscle, the lead that goes through your vein into your heart. Again, there's millions of those. And then on the other side, the subcutaneous system. I tell them, you can't see your heart, right? Because you really don't need to know it, that it's there for me to explain how this device is implanted because it's all under your skin. You know, the device sits here and the lead goes outside your skin, up your sternum, um, but it's all sort of exterior to your chest wall. And as of this year, 17,000 of those devices implanted worldwide. So it's still um, gaining traction, but certainly finding its um, niche. And as you can imagine, there's been many more devices implanted worldwide than in Europe. In fact, we implanted the first um, sub-Q ICD here in the Tri-Cities in March of 2014. And that was for this patient who was featured in the paper um, who had a postpartum cardiomyopathy. So after having children, heart pump function is low. It is not recovering. She is young, has a lot of life ahead of her. Her life's important. She needs to be there for her children. She needs ICD protection. In a young person, we want to keep stuff out of your body as long as possible in case there's complications 30, 40, 50 years down the road from now. So for her, the subcutaneous system is perfect. Gets all the protection while we are preserving everything in the veins and the heart. So that was a, that was a good day for us um, in the Tri-Cities. Advantages to the traditional ICD, and those are, that's a picture of, of the models that are available on the market. They work reliably. Sometimes you can pace people out of their fast rhythms. We call that anti-tachycardia pacing or ATP. If your heart goes too slow, they can pace you like a pacemaker for bradycardia. And the battery life is good. Seven to 10 years and beyond the battery life of these devices, depending on how many times you use them. Disadvantages is the implant procedure is more dangerous than a subcutaneous ICD. So there's complications. Complications hurt patients and they're expensive. On average, and I'll show you data from 2003, over $7,000 per patient on average for complications related to ICD implant. Also, infections are rising. Our patients are older, they're sicker, they're more comorbid, they're more susceptible to infections. When a device gets infected, it has to come out of your body, and that's high risk in somebody who is quite advanced in their disease state. And then finally, lead failure. When there's a lead inside your body, and it's bending with every beat of your heart, and your heart beats 100,000 times per day, and you do that for years on end, that's literally billions of heartbeats, with the lead always going like this, eventually it's going to fracture. And we see that, and that's another disadvantage to the transvenous ICD. So the Achilles heel, we really see, say, is that lead. And there's a picture of an ICD, and the arrows are pointing to the shock coil, which is in the right ventricle. That lead, it's life-saving, but there's complications. You can get someone a pneumothorax, there can be dislodgement, there can be infections, the lead can malfunction. 20% of leads show some malfunction at the 10 year, at, after 10 years of implant, whether that's a conductor failure or an installation problem. Um, there's a 3% risk of infection with generator changes. So every 10 years, we've got to swap out the device under your skin. Every time we go in, we're introducing, potentially introducing bacteria and cause an infection. One of those infections take hold. The whole device has to come out. So that's high risk, and you do this again and again over the lifetime of your patient. ICD patients are living longer, partly because our medications are so good and the devices are saving their lives. So they'll need more and more generator changes. And, as you would imagine, the failures that I've quoted have their highest rates in young active patients. Why? Because they probably put the most stress on their device through all of their activities. You don't want to restrict them, but we realize that it's a high-risk situation. So in those young people, where we can use a subcutaneous ICD instead of the transvenous, um, that's the group that we really um, recommend these th therapies for. These are the annual rates of ICD lead, lead defects from implant year one to year 10. And you can see on average how the rate increases where by the 10th year you can have 20% lead failure complications. We try to improve those things by designing better leads, by using the leads that have proven to be most reliable. Boston Scientific having one of the most reliable leads on the market and stop implanting those leads that have proven to be faulty and have caused failures. And many of you have probably heard of the Fidelis 
um, debacle that we are living through and pulling out of, and more recently the Riata lead failure, which has caused, um, again, a large series of, of complications in implanted patients. Fortunately, far fewer Riata patients than Fidelis patients out there, um, but still those are famous complications that make it into the Wall Street Journal and onto your evening news. And, um, you know, of course, contribute to these statistics. So we want to use reliable leads. How about periprocedural complications? This is comparing a single chamber versus a dual chamber, for example. So I can put in a lead that just goes in your ventricle or one in your ventricle and also a lead in your atrium. Turns out about 60% of implants also will have a lead in the atrium and that causes complications. For the dual chamber, which is in blue, 40% more complications than the single chamber ICD. And that's over 3% of just routine complications per, per implant. And also, there's a mortality risk. If you implant dual chamber, your mortality risk from dying from the procedure or complications from the procedure is up 45%. Still pretty low at 0.4%. But it's a lot, and that's after you have adjusted for all of the confounders. So we realize the transvenous ICDs are associated with implant complications. At 30 days, what are the statistically significant complications? It's pneumothorax. So when you got vascular access, you punct the, puncture the lung, collapse the lung, now they need a chest tube. And cardiac tamponade. How'd you get that? Well, probably the lead perforated, and now you have blood in the sac around your heart. Got to drain that and monitor the patient, make sure it's not recurring before they can leave hospital. At 90 days, it's a mechanical complication where you have to repeat the procedure to fix that or any complication, um, other complications related to the vice where you have to go back in. So both at 30 days and 90 days, we recognize that important complications can happen and that those are expensive. And these are 2003 numbers, but it costs your hospital a lot. If you die from an ICD, on average it's 20,000. Infection, 18,000. Renal failure that now needs hemodialysis, 16,000. The effusions or the tamponade, whoops, we perforated, 8,000. Hematomas, oh, there was a bleeder that we didn't quite get when we closed the pocket, um, $7,000. Pneumothorax, whoops, we punctured the lung, got to put a chest tube, $5,000, and that's in 2003. And when you think about hundreds of thousands of devices nationally and probably 70 to 100,000 devices per year being implanted, these numbers add up quickly, not to mention um, the morbidity that it's causing for patients. So any ICD complication typically lengthens length of stay on average by 3.4 days, cost 7,000 back in 2003, and is a 20% cost increase over an uncomplicated um, admission. So it's a big deal, and we're looking for ways to improve on this. So then we consider the subcutaneous ICD. What are the advantages? It's entirely subcutaneous, meaning it's under your skin, but it's outside your rib cage. So no leads in the heart, the vasculature is untouched, we can place this using land, anatomic landmarks so there's less fluoroscopy and radiation exposure to the patient, also to the implanters. And then we have very sophisticated algorithms to detect the dangerous rhythms we're trying to protect you from and also benign rhythms from the atria, SVTs or AFibs, that can sometimes confuse these devices and they'll shock you inappropriately. So we have advantages in both of those regards and I'll show you how. They, the device will reliably shock your ha heart out of a dangerous rhythm. The shocks will be appropriate. Your vasculature is improved. There's lower implant risk, less lead failure. It's not really a lead in the same sense as the transvenous lead, but it's a tougher lead, if you will. It's outside your body, doesn't move and bend as much, not subjected to the stresses. So a tougher lead that is not subjected to stress is gonna last much longer, um, kind of a no-brainer. So you have that advantage for your impatient. Less infection, if you have to take it out, it's an easier extraction. And the battery life of the device is extending to the point where it's starting to match those of the transvenous ICDs. The most recent model that came out this year now up to 7.3 years of battery, and that compares to five years of the first generation model that was available when this was approved, approved back in 2012. So who are the candidates for an SICD? You have someone who's referred to you for an ICD, you would like to implant an SICD, 
who is eligible. So either primary or secondary, sudden cardiac death event or not, can have it. They must not have a need for bradycardia pacing, that is apparent. The QRS on the ECG can't be too wide because then they might need a CRT system or a CRT upgrade. If their VT is known to be very stable and monomorphic, um, they could benefit from anti-tachycardia pacing. So then you'd probably opt for a transvenous system. And then all the special populations that make us uncomfortable. The young people, age less than 40, we'd like not to expose them to the transvenous system. If you're at high risk for infection, people with indwelling catheters, lots of hardware, they're immunocompromised for whatever reason, they're receiving chemotherapy, um, different reasons to be immunocompromised. If you have lack of venous access, you'll meet people who are completely obstructed in their vasculature because they've been instrumented with PICC lines and hemodialysis filters and catheters too many times. Um, or people who are born with complex congenital heart disease, difficult to put a lead in that very complicated heart. Um, the subcutaneous system can be, can be perfect for those individuals. So those are the candidates. Um, and the device works well in many people. So here we have a graph of the age of implant all the way from very young at 20 years and less, all the way up to 80 and beyond can appropriately receive an SICD. And it doesn't really matter about your weight or your BMI. So that's the graph on the right showing even up to very high BMIs, very obese people, they're good candidates for, this, for the subcutaneous ICD and we shouldn't withhold this therapy from them. Also people who are very lean and petite can hide the subcutaneous ICD very well. The implant can be very um, unencumbered for them and it's still a good option. For the obese people, you realize after you've implanted these that once you've done an insertion and gone down to the rib cage where the ICD should, sh should sit, we're all skinny. Okay, you get through all of that and everybody's nice and small on the inside. So, the, you know, between the device and the lead, it's got that same small little distance to performance and circulation, and all that extra bulk the person has really doesn't matter. Here is the latest version of the SICD. This is the second version of the system, it's called the emblem. It has remote monitoring features which help us manage our patients, understand what rhythms they're having, their heart rates, other things we can do to help them. Um, you know, all that becomes wireless technology which helps us follow our patients. Uh, so these are new features of the new SICD system. And here we compare new versus old. And what change was made? The most important change, and that is they made the device thinner. Because it is on the side, it is a little bit bulky, Everyone wants it to be a little thinner while they'll tolerate how broad the device is compared to other ICDs. So 20% thinner and 40% increase in longevity, meaning we do not have to change these out as often. And that's the change from first generation to, to second generation. And the, the, the difference really is quite striking when you handle these. The ICD system, there it is in the middle. That's the subcutaneous ICD, and that's the old model. And surrounding it are all of the ICDs, transvenous ICDs that would sit on your chest muscle from the other companies. So you can see that the subcutaneous ICD is indeed bigger, but it's in a much less conspicuous site compared to what would sit here. I mean, no one sees you here, whereas this can be um, quite visible. And um, you know, in point of fact, compared to its um, compared to its competitors, for lack of a better term, uh, it's, it's really not too big. We talked about the lead or the electrode. It is tougher. It's subjected to less stress. There's fewer implant complications. Now we're not getting the pneumothoraxes, the dislodgements, the venous occlusions that come with the other lead. There's less mechanical dysfunction. There's no hollow lumen. If you have to take the whole thing out for whatever reason, that is far simpler. And the ability of the system to shock your heart out of a dangerous rhythm, every bit as good, if not better, than the transvenous systems. So that subcutaneous system solves a lot of those peri-implant complications that we saw earlier that can really um, be hard on our patients, very hard on our patients, and also very expensive for, for our healthcare system. So this is a little bit on, on programming. We program the diseases very nicely. We can say anything 200 beats a minute and above, 
Um, use discriminators and really try to choose if you want to shock that rhythm. But then anything that's really too fast, here in this example, 220 and above, for example, just shock it. It's, um, you know, we're not going to trust anything in that, in that range. So you can tailor it to kind of meet the clinical features of um, your patients. And um, when you work with these devices long enough, you learn there's a lot of good that can happen um, when programming is tailored to, to individual patients. We'll just move on to shock therapy. How exactly do these devices shock you and why are they successful? There's a couple of good features. The first of all is that the shock vector really does encompass your entire left chest. So when the ICD lead is on the surface of your body here and the pulse generator is sufficiently posterior, all of that is sandwiching your heart, which is right here. So your heart is completely in the line of fire and in the middle of that shock vector. So we sandwich the heart well, and you'll see we make sure of that um, at the time of implant. And we can do that for all sorts of cardiac sizes, hy orientations, hypertrophy, things of this nature. That device can shock you up to five times rapidly, 80 joules, huge output. Most transvenous ICDs are 35 to 40 joules, so this is double. It can deliver five of those shocks quickly. And then the device is smart. If it didn't convert you with one shock, it's going to reverse the polarity and try it a different way and continue to switch and mix it up until it has been um, successful. The shock that it delivers to your heart is more uniformly distributed over the heart muscle, so less damage to the heart muscle from the shock and a better chance of actually defibrillating successfully. And, and we'll see exactly um, why that's true. So subcutaneous ICD shocks more homogenous that uneven distribu distribution of energy from a typical transvenous system can cause myocardial stunning. The heart is sucker punched, doesn't know what to do, and be damaging to the heart. We see that with troponin elevations, just like you're having a heart attack. And right, those endocardial shocks producing troponin release and um, shocks delivered from the subcutaneous ICD are not associated with this troponin release, indicating that damage to your heart muscle has not occurred uh, with the subcutaneous system. We think that maybe the injury, the studying, stunning associated with a routine ICD shock, the transvenous system, could be responsible for the increased mortality that we see in heart failure patients who receive multiple shocks. We've learned that shocks are not healthy. They save your life, but on average, these are not good for you. So if you have too many, you, your mortality tends to be higher and the debate has always been whether your heart's just sicker or whether it really is the shock that's contributing. And with the SICD, we can see that it is also the shock that's contributing to your mortality because those shocks are delivered in a way that is also harming the heart muscle and that doesn't need to be the case. So the subcutaneous ICD um, works around this problem as well. The trick really is to avoid inappropriate shocks for rhythms that don't really need to be shocked. And that can be a superventricular tachycardia where the heart's going too fast, you're in that 200 plus beat per minute range and the ICD is trying to decide whether it should shock you for that rhythm or not. And that's also true for atrial fibrillation. Just had a patient today, atrial fibrillation, heart rate in the 200 plus beat per minute range, gets an ICD shock. It converts as atrial fibrillation, but you didn't need the ICD to do that. In fact, you didn't want the ICD to do that. So this business of rhythm discrimination is very important and the subcutaneous ICD has sophisticated algorithms to prevent that. It's viewing the heart from three different vectors or points of view if you like and it has what we call a morphologically rich signal. Because it's viewing the heart from outside, the waveforms as you see in the picture, um, they have a lot of detail in terms of their shape and that's gonna help the device recognize that shape when you're in a tachycardia. If the rhythm's coming from the top, even though the heart's going very fast, that shape is gonna be relatively well preserved and the device can recognize that and say, no, this is coming from up above, we don't need to shock for this, so we're gonna withhold therapy. Whereas if the shape of the signal has changed, then that rhythm is probably not coming from the top anymore. Now it's coming from someplace in the bottom, and that's more of a shockable rhythm. 
So that morphology analysis and the signal that the subcutaneous ICD is particularly good um, for this purpose can discern the difference. And we can withhold therapy when it is inappropriate, turns out to be um, an extremely valuable feature. So again, a surface ECG on the top, you see wide signal, lots of detail in that signal. In the middle is a bipolar intracardiac signal. It's just a spike. And that's what a transvenous ICD sees. It just sees a spike, whether you're in sinus rhythm or in your tachycardia. Eh. And it can't make too many conclusions based on the shape of that signal, because it always looks the same. With the subcutaneous ICD, we return to that surface type morphology, that signal rich morphology, where you can analyze um, differences in signal shape and incorporate those into your decision making process. So, so a nice feature that we get in the subcutaneous ICD, um, these algorithms are getting better and better. We have studied how well they worked in the SVT versus VT discrimination. 98% success in distinguishing for the SICD compared to 60, 70, 75% discrimination ability for the transvenous ICDs. Whether you have one lead or two leads, it doesn't really help the device. Interestingly, and that's a little bit counterintuitive, um, but the SICD outperforming the transvenous system single lead or dual lead in terms of rhythm discrimination. Um, so another nice advantage for reproducing um, inappropriate shocks. Again, we have studied this system. The IDE is what we call an investigational device ex exemption. So while it's investigational, we can implant it on a limited basis while we study it to see whether it works. That's what the IDE is. And interestingly, the patients that were included in the subcutaneous ICD system evaluation looked very much in terms of their patient characteristics as those in traditional ICD registries. So we know that the comparison is very valid with those patients who would have received a standard ICD otherwise. And in that IDE, where we're evaluating this device for its approval, we see that it is 100% successful in terminating ventricular fibrillation, 95% in treating events in less than 20 seconds, and 100% successful in converting episodes of spontaneous ventricular tachycardia or fibrillation with a stronger safety signal, 99% free from systemic complications, 92% free from minor complications, and importantly, no deaths seen with the subcutaneous ICD. And you remember there was that 45% difference in death from single chamber versus dual chamber ICD implants, no deaths associated with the subcutaneous system because it's outside of your body and the implant procedure is so much um, less complicated. So we saw good success. This is what authorizes the devices to be implanted. There was a learning curve in terms of how many devices you do, and as the number of devices you do goes up, other complications here, infection goes down. So as operator experience increases and you learn how to really develop that sterile prep for the SICD implant, you will overcome the um, the infectious risk from the implant procedure. And we saw that at a system level as hundreds of patients were implanted. Um, but we do recognize that was an early complication that was infection. Again, in the IDE study results, inappropriate therapies were reduced when we went from the single zone programming to the dual zone programming that I showed you both in terms of oversensing and shocks due to supraventricular tachycardias. The dual zone programming really helped with that, bringing us to an inappropriate shock rate that is comparable to the transvenous ICDs, and that's over a follow-up of two years. So with these devices in the real world, They've been studied using the effortless registry, which is a subcutaneous ICD worldwide experience, mainly European and international. Um, but from you know, thousands of device implants, we've learned even more how these devices perform in the real world. 
So here's the breakdown of ICDs that have been studied around the world, mainly in Europe, also in New Zealand, almost 1,000 patients, 42 sites, over three years of follow-up. So lots of people implanted all over the place by all sorts of different operators um, with good follow-up. How do they perform? So a third for secondary prophylaxis, a third for primary prophylaxis, um, and we see how those patients perform. On average, a relatively young patient population was implanted. Average age was 48, so pretty young. So we're selecting those young patients for the reasons we discussed. 72% were male on average. Ejection fractions were reduced, but not egregiously low. And average weight was mildly obese, but not grotesquely obese. And about a third of those were non-ischemic cardiomyopathies, about a third were ischemic cardiomyopathies. Some had CHF, some had valvular disease, some were just idiopathic ventricular arrhythmias. These dangerous things just show up out of nowhere and for no reason. That's the panel of patients that have been studied in the effortless registry. So how, do the, how does the device perform compared to a traditional ICD? So in do, um, converting an induced ventricular fibrillation event, they're both great, 90% and above. For periprocedural adverse events, 1% for the SICD versus 3% for transvenous. And then at follow-up adverse events, no more complications than the traditional ICD, inappropriate shocks, 7% for the SICD, 4% for the transvenous ICD. So it was higher for SICD, still pretty low, and we're getting better on that. So that's the target, and I'll show you how how we're managing to improve. What about complications? Take lead-related reinterventions, 5% for the transvenous, 1.5% for the subcutaneous, so much less. All complications, almost half for the subcutaneous ICD system, making the procedure that much safer and that much less expensive. And again, that's in a real-world setting, people from the the entire planet um, in planning these procedures. This is what the combined um, experience has been. Again, fewer complications on average. Patient comparisons, very similar. It was interesting that in particularly patients with ischemic cardiomyopathies, which is the majority of our patients, um, were having fewer complications in a statistically important way compared to other patients implanted with the transvenous ICD. Um, so a remarkable observation from that data. We are working to reduce inappropriate shocks and with improved discriminatory um, technology. And we expect that to improve as we go from generation two, which is the ICD we have now, to generation 2.5, which will be MRI compatible and will have even improved um, technology for discriminating between rhythms. So inappropriate shocks in the first year, what we've learned from the effortless registry that was about 8% of patients, and what we are predicting based on those rhythms and the improved discriminators of model 2.5 of the device, we expect that rate to drop to 3.8%, truly that of the um, transvenous systems. So the problem of inappropriate shocks will be neutral compared to transvenous systems when we move into Gen 2.5. So we're getting better. And um, the device is climbing the learning curve very quickly in this regard um, with programming sophistication. You know, anytime you implant a device, you worry, is it going to be the right device? Meaning, will this patient ever need pacing? and therefore I've implanted a device that can't pace? Or will they ever develop a wide QRS and um, therefore need maybe a CRT upgrade? Um, so the progression from the subcutaneous ICD to needing a pacing indication, in point of fact, very small. 0.1% of patients required upgrade to a pacing system. If you have a pacing indication, you can add the pacemaker to the SICD. You don't have to remove the SICD, so that's good news. But really, a very small number of people making that progression. 
recognizing that you have a ventricular arrhythmia that needs ATP and really should have a transvenous lead, again, 0.5% in effortless, so still very small. And then did we have to take out the SICD because we really needed a CRT device, a resynchronizing pacing um, defibrillator system, again, very small, 0.4%. So the chance of implanting the wrong device, very small. You want to think very carefully about these things before you make the decision. Finding out that you need an additional device feature does not mean that you have to remove the SICD or that the SICD is now somehow useless or you can't use the technology or use it to provide the defibrillator function of a transvenous system. Um, so there's workarounds, um, but we can appreciate that so far um, the best data we have is that the need to change out the device at a later time is very small. And I would argue that it might be comparable to the need to change out hardware in a transvenous system. Because sometimes we implant single, single lead devices, find out later that we need dual, dual lead devices. And that requires an upgrade procedure and um, there is always a certain percentage of, of patients who who will require that. And that's from tremendous pressure placed on us by CMS, who reimburses. CMS pressures us to implant single chamber devices when our clinical judgment says they may very well need a dual chamber device, but we can't see that indication clearly yet, so we're sort of compelled to do the single chamber. You find out a year, two, three down the road they really need a dual chamber device, and that becomes a very expensive swap and we're actually faced with those situations frequently. So here, that's a patient where you think may need atrial pacing, for example, but you're not allowed to implant it. Here, you start with someone who you're already very convinced that they're not going to need it. And lo and behold, clinical judgment, most of the time you're right, and the need to upgrade to a pacing system is, you know, very infrequent. So the problem exists for both, but since we're focusing on the SICD, um, we'll just we'll show the results of the... Um, of the effortless registry. And again, just to hammer the point home, 94% complication free at one year. That's in that first 30 days, we're 97% complication free. And over one year, an increase to only, by only 3% in terms of complications. Again, common complications that you would expect from these sorts of procedures, but we appreciate the rates are very low. and less compared to the transvenous systems. So that is reassuring. To conclude and kind of summarize where we've come so far, the effortless registry that we've talked about is the largest SICD database in the world, 1,000 patients over three years of follow-up. Freedom from complications caused by the SICD, very high. Inappropriate shocks, low. All complications, low. There's zero lead or electrode failure in the study. There's zero endovascular or systemic infections resulting from the device. The acute termination of a dangerous rhythm, why we implanted the device, very high, 99.5% success. Appropriate therapy, um, clinically effective in the vast majority. Um, ischemic etiology, not a predictor of, of um, repeated polymorphic VT episodes, for example, um, or monomorphic, so that single lead not indicated in that setting necessarily. Uh, so just because a patient is ischemic doesn't mean they're going to have monomorphic VT and need a transvenous system. For us implanters, it's important to recognize that difference, and sometimes we only know those things after we've benefited from learning the registry results. And then with the latest discriminator, discriminator technology, less than 4% rate of inappropriate shocks with the subcutaneous system, similar truly with the uh, transvenous ICD. So we've learned a lot and the information so far looks very good. Moving on to a little bit more human interest, let's look at some actual um, SICD cases and um, see, see how those went. These are from from our practice. So here's a 50-year-old male that's relatively young in cardiology. 
Um, hypertension, diabetes, he's a non-ischemic, low EF, hasn't gotten better, no pacing indication, needs ICD protection. We chose the subcutaneous system, and we see that this is how it looks on chest X-ray. So on your PA film, here is your pulse generator. And we see that that is right opposite your heart, which is kind of here, the bulk of it. So the shock is going to encompass that muscle. And there is the lead, the defibrillator coil, which sits anterior in your chest. So when you look on the lateral x-ray, you can see that that lead is truly anterior and that the ICD is sufficiently posterior such that shock energy will go between the, the coil and the ICD in a way that really does pass through the heart muscle. So we've sandwiched the heart, so to speak, in terms of the electrical vector, and we know that's going to provide reliable defibrillation for this patient. He is, this fellow is tolerating the device very well. Um, impressed with the initial result, here is about one month post-implant, and you can see the three scars. We have a scar on the lateral side for um, the incision, and you can see the device bul bulkiness sitting under the skin. This is it here. And then we've secured the lead with one incision to the midline and one higher in the sternum. So the lead is sutured here, it's sutured here, tunneled over to the um, defibrillator, which sits here. And um, the, the pictures really accentuate the redness of the scar. In actuality, they look very good and um, have gotten um, smaller. Similar, 56-year-old female, someone who is relatively young, a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, um, not improving, gets a subcutaneous ICD, and we see the same features. That device at the level of the heart, sufficiently posterior, to capture the entire heart with a shock that would pass like this, and um, very well predicted by the SICD system. Um, here she is, two weeks post-implant. We can see the bulkiness of the device, the scar healing well, and her xiphoid incision and her high sternal incision also healing well. The black is in, va is in fact um, iodine from the sterile prep, which is caught in that area, and it's going to wash away, lose that discoloration. So, so really, um, her incision's healing up um, very nicely. Device location well accepted. You see this patient average weight BMI hiding the device very well. Um, in a female, also hiding the device very well at the level of the heart. We plan it in a way that will hopefully incorporate the, the um, bra strap and not be um, an inconvenience. And for cosmetically concerned patients, you observe, you um, avoid the bulky device that can sit over your pectoral muscle and, um, and be a little too obvious for some people. So the device usually sits well. Some special clinical situations, here is a subcutaneous ICD that we implanted for lack of venous access. We actually plan to put a transvenous ICD and um, bilateral venograms, here's the right venogram, left venogram, the veins are totally obstructed. In this person who has had a lot of chemotherapy, pick lines on both sides, those, those um, catheters will scar your veins, they can result in blockages. You know, collaterals work their way around those blockages, so the patient's getting their blood flow, but you can't implant through um, collaterals, so no options for venous access. In the old days, we would have had to get very fancy epicardial patches, uh, things of this nature. Um, in today's day and age, we have the perfect solution um, for someone of this nature, which is the subcutaneous system. And indeed, they, they, they got that device. So how do we implant? Um, very carefully. Lots of pre-procedure planning. In point of fact, it's really easy, and it goes really smoothly. You just plan, and you never get trapped. So under fluoroscopy, we identify the position of the heart, and then we place a model ICD right on the patient's chest, and we mark it with a black marker. So we know exactly where we want it to sit under the skin um, as we implant. And here you'll see um, that device carefully marked. Here we've drawn a circle around where the device we want to sit. We do the incision about a centimeter above that, so it will drop into that space. That's on the mid-axillary line, so it's sufficiently posterior to the heart. And we mark the trajectory of our lead as it comes up to the midline and up the sternum so it will be perfectly midline and really be sure to um, encompass that patient's heart muscle 
um, for the purposes of shocking. We then do sterile drapes that gives us access to all the important sites um, and allows us to work efficiently. This really is the most interesting part of the procedure and probably the unique part of the procedure, which is the lead tunneling. So we know the lead is attached to our ICD here on the side. And if that's true, how do we get the lead to come up the middle of the patient's chest wall? Well, we use this tunneling tool and you can see we've skewered through just under the skin outside the rib cage. And here's that tool coming out at the level of the pocket. And then we're just gonna tie the lead to the tip of that tool and pull it under the skin to the midline. And then very similarly, we'll advance it up the chest. But really that tunneling part is what you're a little nervous doing it the first time and is sort of the unique part of the, um, of the procedure. In point of fact, um, it's, it's, it's not very difficult. We do those things under general anesthesia, both to help with patient positioning and pain, so they're not subjected to pain. Because it's very hard to anesthetize that entire track using you know, lidocaine or local anesthetic. So we do that under general anesthesia so the patient doesn't expect it. And when they wake up, the pain from that is really very routine or non-existent. No one's grabbing their side complaining of pain, interestingly. And it's very easy to manage as long as you can get them through the actual um, implant. So we do it under general. And everyone does really well and it's not an issue. We have always tested the device in the lab before we wake the person up, make sure it actually is going to work and reliably defibrillate. And this ECG lead shows um, how we test. So here is somebody, there's a little bit of noise on the lead, but this is them in normal sinus rhythm. And then from the device, we pace very rapidly, so we deliver these super fast um, bursts. Then we stop. We observe that the patient is in ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. We watch the device charge up here. This took um, 16 and a half seconds to recognize, charge, and deliver a 65 joule shock of energy which restored normal sinus rhythm. So here we see normal QRS complexes. So we induce that dangerous rhythm, watch the device recognize, successfully shock out. That gives us a lot of confidence that um, the system is going to work. Again, the post-op x-ray, we want that device to sit right at the level of the heart, posterior to the heart, so it sandwiches the muscle when it delivers a shock, and all of that implant planning and markup guarantees that we have this result when we're finished. So it becomes a very mechanical, methodical process of implanting where you just proceed carefully, don't skip any steps, and you'll end up with a nice result um, pretty much every time. So here is a gentleman post-operative day one. Um, he has quite a large chest. Those are the stereo strips on the side incision and the xiphoid and upper sternal incisions. The device is sitting there. He's hiding it very nicely. So that's what you can find on post-operative day one when the patients go home. A little bit of Percocet to cover any um, you know, pain they may have for the first two, three days um, as that procedure begins to mature. So again, overall, in summary, um, the SICD is an unprecedented opportunity to give someone, provide ICD protection as providers, doctors, nurses, allied health professionals. We have to identify risk, advise patients, offer ICDs where it's appropriate, and encourage compliance. You know, not be too neutral, but convince people that this is the best thing for them because they're um, probably not understanding their risk. SICD for both a primary and a secondary um, prophylaxis protection. We avoid complications from the implant, from lead failure, from infection, from extraction. And when you meet people who have complications or need extractions or have lead failures down the road, it's a tough position to deal with and you'd like not to um, have those difficult discussions with people and then, you know, the um, procedures to fix those complications. Honestly, if you can avoid that situation, your life's going to be a lot happier and we run to opportunities to um, minimize those things because um, they, they can be exceedingly difficult for patients um, when those complications occur. So I would say consider the SICD when there is no apparent need for bradycardia pacing, antitachycardia pacing, or you're anticipating a CRT upgrade um, in the near future. Chances are you're going to be exactly right 
and your chance, your need to swap out the device will be very, very low. And um, really your clinical judgment can serve you very well in appropriate device selection. And that includes um, offering people the SICD. And it is excellent for young patients, very complex patients, patients with lots of comorbidities, prior infections, poor venous access, all those situations, um, that device serving us um, brilliantly.